Alright, here we are folks. Welcome to the official finale of the Paranormal Activity series Retrospective, The Ghost Dimension. It really was quite a ride going to the theater every October to see a Paranormal Activity movie, and then again picking over each of them for this retrospective, knowing how it all ends. We had a really interesting mythology developing and some good scary times, but then, you know, we also had the forkening and Katie's Midnight Stumble and Witches vs. Gang Members. If PA4 was the troublesome teen years, then the Marked Ones played with the series' turbulent young adulthood. And now, here we are, all grown up and according to the producers, ready to answer all the questions. Why did the midwives kidnap Hunter twice? What's Allie been doing? What's the difference between the Marked Ones and these kids, etc. Wait, what? None of those? It's in 3D? How do you find footage in 3D? Who asked for this? Yeah, fine. Roll that beautiful back snapping footage. The scene keeps going into probably the next morning where the girls are being introduced to this guy who's maybe, you know, 41% Big Lebowski and the rest is a mixture of creepy cult programmer and uh, ponytail. And you're going to have a son who is one of the chosen and Katie going to have to take care of your sister and a lot of others. You think he meant to take care of him in the mob sense? Because that's clearly how she's taken it. Katie has killed at least five people in the series, not counting however many uh, hobos she accidentally bumped into in her demonic shuffle from Mika's house to Christie's. Well, that musing aside, we move to uh, 2013, two years after Hunter was reinducted into the cult and returned to Santa Rosa, California, where PA3 was set. Here we're introduced to Leela, who will be our demonically connected child for this outing. Running the camera for now is her father, Ryan. They're getting ready to greet Ryan's brother, Mike, who will be visiting them over the Christmas holiday. That's right, this is a Christmas movie, and the fine tradition of Gremlins, Batman Returns, and Die Hard. The cast is rounded up by Ryan's wife, Emily, and this lamp sure is pretty. We're treated to several more scenes of random waffling before we find out that the lamp is a friend of Ryan and Emily's named Skylar, who's staying with them while she attends a yoga retreat, which uh, I really thought involved retreating and doing yoga, and not, you know, hanging out in this glorious McMansion being haunted by a tremendously ADD demon named Toby. With all the introductions out of the way, we cut to Ryan and Mike sorting through lights and decorations to put up in the yard when they find the infamous stolen box of Katie and Christie's home movies, which has been conveniently loaded by the cult with an archaic early 80s video camera. Sweet deal. Ryan cleans it up, which exposes a claw mark, or a raccoon pop, or a demon the size of a raccoon. Apparently these OG camcorders recorded full 4K resolution just with some scan lines. We just needed television technology to catch up. With analog clearly being the better format for anything ever, I think it's time to bring back VHS and 8-tracks. With this new camera comes the first sign of paranormal activity. In this case, some ghostly dandruff lingering in the living room. It says here if you mix head and shoulders with some sage, it works great for dry, itchy protoplasm. If you saw this in theaters, this stuff was in 3D. Especially when Ryan takes the camera inside one of these spatial anomalies like an overenthusiastic Starfleet captain. So while we're talking about it, let's get this out of the way. 3D tends to be perceived as pointless gimmickry. Which it is, I'm not going to bullshit you guys, but the thing is that there's nothing inherently wrong or non-traditional about gimmicks, just like jump scares. Pointless gimmickry has been a part of horror since at least the 1960s. From Hitchcock's no-late admissions into psycho policy and everything William Castle did, all the way up to uh, sense around IMAX and 3D. That said, studios have a bad tendency to throw 3D on a movie because, yeah, that's what the kids like, right? So you end up with really pointless shit being written into the movie that exists only because you need to do something to show your movie is using 3D and don't add anything. This is all the exercise I need. But that's not really how this movie uses its 3D. There's not a lot of random junk popping obviously out of the screen. Instead, the majority of the movie is 2D, and only the uh, demonic effects and supernatural shimmers are 3D, which is really interesting. Adding depth to the normally 2D experience is supposed to enhance immersion and help the audience feel like we're in the movie's world. But by deliberately leaving the movie's world flat, the ghost dimension pushes the actual paranormal activity through the fourth wall and into some weird shared space between the movie's world and ours, which I think shows a little bit more thought and creativity than yo-yo tricks. This is all the exercise I need. 
Moving on from that digression, the movie finishes up its first night with this somewhat awkward exchange. Hi. I'll have sex with you. Oh. <laughs> Onward, Ryan, to the extracurricular! It's okay. Stay in the mood. A day or two later, Mike and Ryan are home alone hanging out, and Mike slips Ryan some drugs in the form of fine Belgian chocolate that is so obviously edible pot, I think at this point Ryan could have just said, Yes, get me stoned. And saved us all a lot of time. Not, it's not an edible. <laughs> After a while, they switch to beer and decide to hunt through the VHS box looking for sex tapes, because apparently it's like a law of nature that if two or more VHS tapes are left in a box, they will generate a sex tape. And apparently they've never heard of the internet. Their odd brotherly bonding aside, they do find Dennis's attempt before giving up on the 80s and trying out opening doors from the 90s tapes. They gave it an enigmatic name. Colty Von Lebowski is a bit pretentious. Maybe he's also like, I don't know, a 7% art house director. Okay, keep thinking about it. Focus, Chris. Ryan, that's a kid! Abort! Abort! If this is a porno, you don't want any of it. You're too pretty for prison. They ignore my warnings and keep watching the tape, which is of the cult teaching Christy to see through Toby. After the jump scare, the power goes out, and Ryan starts tracking some of that ghostly dandruff stuff around the house until Mike... Go! ...pins the scene. Just to give Skylar something to do, they tape a vaguely spiritual background onto her and let her suggest to Ryan that he's got some sort of spirit videography. But most of the time, these cameras, they don't pick up on beings as much as, you know, different planes of existence. And then she gets a lengthy nighttime spook scene with Mike, which starts when she sends him inside to get some wine. The first happening is a black shape that flies at the camera and gives her the heebie-jeebies. The lights go out right after Mike gets back, but instead of figuring out how to get the lights back on, they just activate 80s cam's night vision and see the teeter-totter movie. Noise and ripples in the water take them over the... Wait, hold on a second. This camera is probably old enough to have recorded Methuselah's fourth grade cello recital, and it has night vision? There's no scan lines. The night vision is actually better than the regular video coming out of it? I am calling bullshit, okay? The camera sees ghosts. Fine, that's your shtick this time, but you can only push the suspension of disbelief so far. And unless the camera is seeing the ghosts of sunshine, night vision wasn't an option on consumer cameras until the late 90s. And even then, it cost thousands of dollars. The scene gets a few good starts otherwise, and does have some light tension, but it ends when Mike and Skylar run into Leela, who's apparently been hanging out in the woods bearing religious items. There's yours? God, yeah! We're gonna get one final night of creepiness before we officially set up tripods and begin surveillance, so this starts with Ryan doing occult research and watching Featherston family movies at 2 in the morning. He gets distracted and misses one of the obviously paranormal events, and then because this is a found footage movie and we've got to film everything, he goes absently wandering around the house with the camera. Eventually, he hears Leela chanting something in the upstairs bathroom and finds her with her hand on the mirror. Now, he takes her away to bandage her hand, which really seems like something you would do in the bathroom, but hey, this house is massive. Maybe he's got a first aid room. I want to make a note here that none of this property damage is ever mentioned at all. A producer probably decided the original effect was too subtle and wanted to punch it up. I'd imagine the director had to talk them down from this version. She was apparently chanting Bloody Mary for no real reason other than it was done in PA3 and the writers liked it. But it made sense there. Randy prompted it and Katie did it to feel cool. Nothing prompts it here, which is a big problem with this movie. There are just so many moments that just feel like Paranormal Activity's greatest hits. The next day, Mike finds a cement block with Katie and Christie's names finger painted in it from 1987. They do some research and find out that their house burned down in 1992 and Ryan's house was built on the same plot. Armed with this fact, the theory that they're the same Katie and Christy as the tapes, the weird video evidence, and some of Leela's odd behavior, Ryan convinces Emily to let him... What else? 
put cameras around the house to catch the ghost that he thinks Gila is talking to. I feel like this movie really took its time getting to it, but night number one finally begins, and it begins with a hell of a shell. This black oily column comes up out of the floor next to Leela's bed and just sits there flowing ominously for like three hours until it shoots over to the foot of her bed and she wakes up and talks to it. Okay. Skylar wanders in to get her back to sleep and gets hit with some surprise demonic bump and grind. And thus ends night one. And then in the morning, Ryan sold his tapes of undeniable proof positive of the supernatural for millions of dollars and family retired to Barbados and in the movie. Or Ryan could just ask Leela what the name of the demonic black oil creature that visited her from the depths of hell was. That's reasonable too. It's a bit of an underreaction, but who am I to judge? Who's Toby? Ryan puts a few clips together and figures that the thing from the video is the same Toby that Katie and Christy have been talking to in the tapes. They track some more ghostly blobs through the house up to Leela's room, and if you look closely here, this is actually the first time in the movie that we see Leela's written Hunter's name on her blackboard. Ryan tries to tuck her back under the covers, but then this evil-looking black shape jumps out. After that, Ryan moves the spirit definition camera to the upstairs hallway. That night, Toby materializes in Leela's room, and she goes downstairs to destroy a Bible and turn the gas to the fireplace on. She's having a little bit of trouble getting any matches lit, which gives Emily some time to run downstairs and pull her away. She puts Leela back to bed and comes back down to pull the pages out of the fireplace, dodging blob Toby tendrils the whole time. But when she gets all the way back there, the gas turns back on, which is kind of odd. I mean, Toby can't poke her in the shoulder, but he can wrench this thing on with authority. Finally, the angel heirloom tree topper falls down, which buttons up the scene. Later the next day, Ryan has been watching more tapes and summarizes some of the salient points from Mike. Right? No, the mom and her boyfriend, uh -huh. they're completely absent in the footage. And it's like this weird cult is taking care of these girls now. And, and they're calling this other woman mom. He apparently hasn't found the tape where they bend Dennis the wrong way yet. There's nothing in between. Just no. Interesting to note that the cult seems to have brainwashed the girls into forgetting Julie and thinking that Lois is their mom, which not only fails to patch the plot hole from OGPA when Mika refers to Katie's mom, I shouldn't let your mother come over anymore. That's because Katie's mom is dead no matter which way you slice it. But this actually doubles down on the failure by contradicting the opening of PA3 when Katie refers to Grandma Lois while dropping off the tapes at Christie's. Somehow I ended up with it after Grandma Lois died. So, great job. Night number four begins with Ryan watching more 92 tapes with Mike. And while they watch the tape, Christy seems to be describing the room that they're in. They go for another concentration face jump scare, this one in the form of Leela startling them. She does provide excellent evidence that the tapes from 92 are Christy psychically scrying into the future, which they go over the next day. Leela sneezes, and then Christy says, bless you. So we're watching Ryan film himself, showing Emily and Skyler a video of he and Mike filming themselves, watching a witch's coven filming Christy in 1992, having visions of them watching her on tape in 2013. And if this gets any more meta, I'm gonna need a flowchart. That aside, Toby's convinced Leela to draw a bunch of occult symbols on the wall of her room, which looks a lot like the symbols from the time travel door in the marked ones. Emily and Ryan see them later, and while Ryan does recognize some of them from the tapes and his research in the midwives, no one seems to care that given how high they are on the wall, the only way Leela could have drawn them is if she had a ladder or a repelling harness in her closet. I think the filmmakers missed a huge opportunity here for a creepy shot of Leela giggling and drawing while being held in the air by Toby. While Emily and Ryan are expositing, they hear an odd high-pitched whine from Leela's room and go up to see energy waves coming from the end of the recorder that Leela is blowing into. For a really, really long time. They try to grill Leela a bit more about Toby, but she's too zonked out to answer, and they're unfortunately derailed by a loud thud from outside. And then the scene ends with a jump scare. This movie runs a bit long, so I've been using the theatrical cut so I can skip some of the more pointless moments of the director's cut, but there's a whole middle section of the scene in there that I thought was actually kind of awesome. The highlights are a quieter thud, Ryan going out and finding the glowing Santa that he was entranced by when Mike and him got high, but given the context, he looks way more menacing. Back in Leela's doorway is the silhouette of a full-sized Santa. 
Ryan thinks it's Mike playing a prank, but it vanishes entirely right when Emily shows up and then the scene continues as before. I can see why they cut it. It doesn't make a lot of sense the stuff that Toby would do. It's a little bit slow, it gets repetitive if they end it the way they did with the jump scare, and it also relies on another cut scene to explain the Santa suit. But I think it provides some identity by way of a Santa motif and some much needed tension to a movie that is otherwise a bit loud and jump heavy. Moving on from that, apparently most churches will hang up at Help my daughter is haunted, can you guys send a young priest and an old priest? But after spending most of the morning on the phone, Emily gets Our Lady of Cannon Fodder to send over Father Todd. On the way up to Leela's room, the priest does notice the name Hunter and points it out. Just in case you're not some sort of obsessed fan who watched the movie frame by frame looking for secret clues and found it early. He tries to bless Leela and her teddy bear, but she's having none of it and tries to take a chunk out of his jugular vein, so he pieces out. Are you talking to me? That's much too vulgar display of power. Ryan finds some comfort in his old friends, the Someone Else's Home Movies, and finds the only tape from the current millennium, which sounds like Colty Von Dude touring the rebuilt house and praising several Toby Ready design features. Naturally, this freaks Ryan out, so he calls the realty company they use and finds out that the realtor that showed them the house never worked for them, which he spins into a gigantic conspiracy theory. So apparently on top of the evil videographer making the tapes, the cult also had an evil realtor and an evil general contractor. Given everything that's happened, Emily decides to sleep in Leela's room and makes camp for night number six. But apparently she's not alarmed enough to clean the wall. The night starts pretty dramatically. Walk into the club like what up? Ryan goes to wake up Emily and a toy goes off on its own. <laughs> Escaping from the wrath of Christmas music, they wind up looking over the living room where Toby pops through one of the movie's many plot holes to give Mike a wedgie. Toby reappears in the Christmas tree and then bum rushes the camera, leading Mike and Ryan to hide in the kitchen. For some damn reason, Toby doesn't know where they are and can't pass through a kitchen island despite being one with a Christmas tree a minute ago. I'm pretty sure there's nothing in the manual about food prep areas being off limits. And so they close out the scene with another selection out of Paranormal Activity's greatest hits. In the morning, Ryan and Mike have an errand to run, leaving Emily and Skylar home alone with Leela, who is hell-bent on hosting this tea party. Especially since Toby is making such a grand entrance to it. The guys come back and start digging for a specific tape. They had apparently found Paranormal Activity 3's final reel and took it to the police, which was interesting enough for them to be told about Hunter Ray's disappearance because he happened to have the same birthday as Leela. Ryan finds the tape he wanted, which shows Hunter in 1992. Given that he wouldn't be born until 13 years after that, he figures that the cult will use their evil time travel door to abduct Leela and bring her into the past. Thankfully, he hasn't found any footage of Leela and created a Star Trek-like causality loop. Oh, and let's nip this in the bud right now. June 6th, 2005 is not 666. 2005 is only the sixth year of the 2000s. The millennium didn't start until 2001, not 2000. The most hellish thing about Leela and Hunter's birthday is that it was a Monday. They're going to try another visit from Father Todd tomorrow, but before that we have to get through night number seven. And since absolutely no attempt was made to clean up or paint over the occult symbols on Leela's wall, they activate, collapsing reality and punching a hole through space and time from our world into the ghost <laughs> Leela climbs in and after several hours, a massive blast of energy comes from the doorway and knocks the camera off. I have no idea what that was. I checked the manual and there's nothing in here. Leela! Please! Well, they're looking for Leela. I want to complain. I want to complain about the randomly appearing and disappearing timestamps on this camera. I think it might be trying to convey on the tripod versus handheld, but the characters manually switching it on or off in situations like this is so unrealistic that it seems like the editor just sort of forgot to put it in there half the time. Anyway, everyone in the house is fully dressed at 3.30 a.m., which kind of makes sense given how camera happy Ryan apparently is. A thumping noise brings them to Leela's room where they find her just hanging out in true creepy kid fashion. Are you okay? I'm gonna set on free, Daddy. We're leaving. Ryan, let's go! 
Normally people will pack their bags before they leave the house, but family is trying something new, so Mike and Skylar come back to collect some clothes, medicine, etc. with the magic cam in tow, just in case Toby decides to start something. The massive portal in Weevil's room has been downgraded to a minor crack, and Skylar finds a strange drawing in her closet. Somehow they've been there for so long that it's gotten dark, which is bizarre, unless they didn't get there until, like, four in the afternoon. You know, I don't know, maybe they took in the continental breakfast at their hotel, rented a movie on the pay-per-view, and then went back to the house to get some luggage. Ryan's research is apparently important enough to be included in the emergency pickup, and Skylar finds a much more professionally rendered version of the multi-eyed lamb along with a relevant Bible verse. I'm gonna put the actual verse on the screen here. Slain lamb will be used against God, for the blood of the chosen ones will taint it and help give life to one of the seven princes of hell. They do misquote it a bit, but you know the whole two born of the blood of the same moon thing is a lot more topical with Hunter and Leela sharing the same birthday, so let's run with it. And with that nugget, the plot finally congeals. The midwives are going to use Hunter and Leela in a ritual to give Toby a human body. Not really sure why he needs one, he's been pretty powerful so far, and between the midwives and the marked ones, he's got a fair decent posse, but hey, you know, maybe he wants to go water skiing. Somehow, Leela's escaped her parents and gotten back into the room where she's absentmindedly scratching at the crack and delivering another creepy kick chain. As the movie rolls into its final reel, Father Todd comes back to perform an extermination which involves luring Toby into the open and depositing him into a bathtub full of holy water. So in order to put a stop to the coven's plot to give Toby the demon a physical form, the priest is going to physically wrap Toby in a blessed bedsheet and dunk him underwater. Sure, okay, let's roll. They grab Leela for bait and pretty much immediately things go wrong. Two priests, guys, you need two priests for these things to work. You got about 12 seconds to ordain one of the others. Father Todd goes down first, and then I guess Toby decides that he should let the humans get in a few punches, so it seems like a fairer fight. The family seems to buy that they've won before noticing evil veining on Skylar, who vomits some sort of acid onto Mike. Yet where was that stuff when the coven was being attacked by a gangster with a shotgun? It could have been useful. Leela makes a break for the portal and her parents follow her up. Conveniently for the action, Ryan gives up the camera right before Toby impales him out of fucking nowhere. With nowhere else to run, Emily chases Leela into the portal and winds up in Katie and Christie's room in 1992. After a brief funhouse sequence chasing Leela around, Emily runs into a figure that's probably Katie. She has lines, so it's probably not a random witch. Several more jump scares corral Emily into the garage where she gets back together with Leela, who has not been sacrificed. Though if she's fine, what's dripping from the ceiling? I guess I guess we got even odds that it's Hunter or a goat. He's alive, huh, Mommy? He's real, just like you and me. Well, with the ritual complete and Toby arriving to plunge the world into darkness, there's only one thing left to do. A grand reveal of Toby's human form. Get away from us! A skinny dude that seeps smoke? That's what we get? Six fucking movies and Toby's hairy naked demon ass is about as intimidating as DJ Qualls? The Coven had to turn the entire space-time continuum on its head to make Toby manifest on our physical plane, and their dark fucking lord winds up with the raw muscular power of Steve Rogers before the experiment? They had more money than the first three movies combined and couldn't find one single guy that hadn't skipped leg day? Toby's new bod is what I have to focus my feelings about this movie onto, and those feelings are not good ones. The Ghost Dimension aggressively rehashes Paranormal Activity's greatest hits without any regard for context or established continuity. They were so focused on referencing moments from all the other movies while deliberately ignoring all the dangling plot threads that almost nothing they do here makes sense. They repeated the kitchen cabinet scare from 2 because for some reason Toby couldn't make it through or around a kitchen island. Leela plays Bloody Mary like in PA3, but backwards, either because it's creepy or to make it less obvious. The midwives need to give Toby a body in 1992 because the marked ones introduced a time travel mechanic. All that and they completely missed the opportunity to have Ryan read from the book on demons that Mika had in movie one. Despite the producer's promises that this final entry would tie up all the loose ends and answer all the questions, the ghost dimension just leaves me with more questions. What happened to Allie? What happened to Randy? 
Why do they need to give Toby a body in 1992 and not after they kidnapped Hunter in 2006? Or after they kidnapped Hunter in 2011? Or after they kidnapped Leela in 2013? Just to reference the line about Katie and Christie's house burning down? Did Toby burn the house down after getting his body? Or did the Coven burn it down in a paradoxical scheme to build a demonic invasion ready house and sell it 20 years later to some family with a kid born on a 666 that only works if you use bad math? If the midwives have been around for hundreds of years, why not use kids from 1906 or 1905? Why bother mentioning the girls got brainwashed to forget their real mother so Lois and Ponytail could raise them when it directly contradicts the opening scene of Paranormal Activity 3? Look, I thought the 3D was clever, everything looks pretty alright on paper, and it seems like, cool, we'll finally figure out the Coven's endgame. But the plot is held up with spit and wishes, so as soon as you question anything in the movie, the whole thing just crumbles. Not to mention the move towards action horror has left none of the tension of the earlier series entries and punctuates every single night the big loud jump scare. Unfortunately, a very disappointing way to end a series as influential as Paranoia TV was. For anyone curious about the final complete and explained timeline, stay tuned for the companion video coming out shortly after this one. I do hope you've had a fun or at least interesting ride with me during this retrospective of the Paranormal Activity series, and I think we've all learned a lot about demonic motivation. It's been a hell of a time picking through all of these movies over the last way too many years. Anyway, that's my time. Please subscribe and make sure you check the bell to be notified of new videos. Thank you so much for watching with me. Cheers, folks, and stay tuned for more Modern Horror. You better make sure you learn how to spell Cause if you don't, you're burning in hell Santa Claus is coming I said Santa Claus is coming I said Santa Claus is coming I said Santa Claus is coming